Well, thanks for coming out. This is a pretty good sized crowd. Um, this time of year we do it at 9 and at 6. Um, first thing, I want to introduce three of our uh, summer interns. Um, I don't know if you all want to say anything about you. You you're were written about in the e-newsletter. I hope you saw that. But uh, Libby, um, I'll never forget your name. Oh, you have your title. <laughs> Liv Libby Indermauer, Adam DeRose, and Shelby Farrell. Um, I do want to introduce one other person, our newest employee, and she's, uh, I think she just gave me the finger. Uh, <laughs> Leanne Keneally. Leanne um, was, uh, her position was made possible by Dr. Denny Werner, the breeder of red buds and other, and uh, budlias and other things. And um, uh, Dr. Werner needs uh, Leanne's help for part of the time, but we get most of the hours that he's paid for. So a great big thanks to um, uh, Dr. Werner. And Leanne is working in our nursery, and it's, I, got it, I got it easy in that my position here started in October. So we're going into the cold, gray part of the year when the nursery is not very demanding. And once it became warm, sunny springtime, suddenly, you know, the nursery was demanding a huge amount of time, and so uh, Leanne came in just at the right time. Um, as always, feel free to ask questions as we go along, and though we do um, you know, choose topics for these plantsman's tours, probably back in December, so we have a whole calendar worth of topics. We don't have to stay strictly on the topic, but it is a topic of um, interest to me. Um, so let's begin. Native cross vine is about done with that trumpet check flower you might imagine that hummingbirds visit. Um, this is the selection uh, Jekyll, or, yeah, from Jekyll Island. Um, it's a real beautiful vine. It's an evergreen. If you have a really tall, um, like loblolly pine, a former client of mine called them Q-tip pines because you know you have this long straight chunk trunk and just a little bit up top. They're great for climbing up a. Um, a loblolly pine or similar pine. Um, I do have to point out the fact that it, like so many vines it will also travel across the ground great distance so it's not a low maintenance plant but a really beautiful native. You, you can have a garden full of flowers but not support any pollinators. When uh, humans start selecting flowers for double flowers or they start hybridizing sometimes you end up with flowers that don't attract insects and often what happens when you um, when a flower becomes double is that the reproductive parts become the additional petals um, and so there's there's no more nectar in the flower there's no more uh, pollen because some insects like honeybees collect pollen um, and so um, a lot of double Double flowers are no longer no longer support pollinators. Everyone knows lantana, um, superb pollinator plant. Butterflies especially like the flowers, but hummingbirds will also visit them. Um, this winter was um, really a test of which ones are the most cold hardy. Um, Miss Huff, of course, is one of the most cold hardy. This one, I think, is citrus salad. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, hey, Marilyn. Um, and it has sported to a pink form. There's one called ham and eggs, which are plants of ham and eggs. Some of them didn't come through this winter. Um, my plants at home of star landing, which is, you know, orange peel orange and lemon peel yellow. So it's a much clearer color than um, this huff came through the winter just fine. You're a real quiet group this what's morning. Your, what's your usual question, Marilyn? Oh, know do, that the deer do not eat lantana. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions as to what deer do or do not eat. Um, I do agree that deer generally don't eat lantana. Now, my th three, well, two of my three dogs will eat all the flowers off of lantana. Um, and uh, so I don't grow lantana in the backyard, which is where, you know, they're... The backyard is fenced in, so when they're out of the house, that's where they are. But um, when my dogs have an upset stomach, the first thing they eat is verbena bonariensis, um, which is the same. Verbenas 
Lantana and Vitex and Calocarpa. They're all in the same family and generally deer don't eat them. Stand under this red maple tree, but I'm going to share with you something that uh, the Arboretum's director, Mark Wethington, shared with me. That in the springtime, one of the most important nectar sources for honeybees is our native Acer rubrum, the red maple. Now, a lot of new gardeners think when you say red maple, you mean one of the red leaf forms of Japanese maple, like the one behind us. Um, but our native maple is called red maple because the flowers are red and um, often the fall color is red. Now, I grew up in northern New Jersey near New York City and I probably wouldn't be alive today if there wasn't Acer rubrum because if you've grown up in colder climates you know that February is the hardest month of the year to get through. It's like 300 days long and there's not one speck of sunshine but the only thing giving you hope is that the red maple flower buds are starting to swell in that month. Um, but you know we can fill our gardens with flowers um, but they're it's not always the showy things that are really good supporters of pollinators. No, hollies, are, honeybees especially, love hollies. And the flowers on hollies are small enough that you might not even realize they're in bloom. Um, but if you stand next to like a Nellie R. Stevens hedge in full bloom, it'll, it'll just be buzzing with bees. And if you turn around, you can see the Japanese crepe myrtle, the uh, Lagerstromia forii in bloom. And it's kind of cool and gray this morning, so I don't know if you'd have that experience, but um, in the warmth of the day, that will just be buzzing with bees, uh, largely honeybees. And there's, well, beyond the um, handicapped parking sign is on the other side of the path is a narrow columnar pair. And um, we all know how bad um, Bradford pears smell and bloom. Well, the thing to remember is that there weren't honeybees before there were flowers, but long before there were flowers there were flies and beetles. So smelling really bad meant that you had a good chance of being pollinated by a fly or, or a beetle or other things attracted to carrion. Um, so I guess if we're going to get really serious about planting pollinator gardens, we should plant things that feed the flies as well. <laughs> I do want to point out one thing unrelated to this topic, and that is we finally found a really good location and planted the replacement for the lace par parasol elm, um, which was the dead tree wearing pajamas over by the necessary. Um, and in Probably all of you know the story of the lace uh, parasol elm. The plant that is now dead and it died of Dutch elm disease was that was the original plant. It was found in the in a woods in Chatham County and brought here. So, you know, all these distinct cultivars start out as a single individual. Um, Panther Creek, a really good wholesale nursery south of here, um, has it in production. So. We have a nice replacement and the plant was actually donated by I'm not gonna I'm not I'm not gonna mention the donor's name because I'm not sure I have it exactly correct. Mimosas. The flowers are fragrant. I know um, mimosas are somewhat of a problematic plant in that they, they do naturalize, but I don't think they're a real serious invasive exotic because you will see them along a roadside, but they don't take over our um, native woodlands because they're not shade tolerant. You know, the same could be set, um, set of uh, Polonia, the empress tree of China, the one that has the great big stalks of lavender flowers about the time that dogwoods are finishing blooming and has the great big fuzzy leaf. Um, again, it, it, Polonia doesn't invade our native woodlands, again, for the same reason that they're not shade tolerant. Um, Verbena bonariensis, as Tony Avent likes to call it, verbena on a stick. Um, bonariensis means of Buenos Aires, so it's native to South America. There's a very um, 
similar species that looks very much like this, but is not as showy. Every, you know, the flowers are much smaller. Co uh, Verbena brasiliensis. Does anyone want to guess where that's from? <laughs> um, it used to be a better plant, but in recent years it always develops powdery mildew. But um, butterflies love the flowers, and after it's been in bloom for a long time, these inflorescences get bigger and bigger and they're full of seeds and you'll see the goldfinches on them eating the seeds. When the plant gets shabby, I cut it to the ground and it'll soon be back in bloom. Now we all we all refer to this as a, a flower and I would never argue with somebody and say it's not a flower but it's a, a cluster of flowers. And in a lot of the composites you have what we generally call petals but are actually separate flowers and these are the ray flowers and then in the center you have the disc flowers and in a lot of cases the ray ray flowers are um, they don't have any reproductive parts um, and then the disc flowers do and that's what the bees and the um, other pollinators visit and I always think of these um, ray petals as not being, not just being uh, attractive, you know, something that a, a, a butterfly flying by sees and says, oh, there's something to visit. But they're also great landing pads if you're a big butterfly and you can, you know, perch on the petal and feed on the flower. Um, you know, the, the old fashioned zinnias have exactly the same kind of arrangement. And if you want a really good pollinator plant, just buy a package of uh, zinnia seeds and sow them yellow and coral flowers is one of the red yuccas. They're not a yucca, um, but they are a yucca relative. They're Hesper aloe. Um, Hesper referring to uh, the evening. Um, you know, I, with the scientific, I'm just silencing my phone. Um, with uh, the scientific names of plants, you know, they, they come from all different sources, which is why I use the term scientific rather than Latin names. And so we have both Latin and Greek for, um, you know, two of the sources. And so some plants get, get called Hesperalo and other plants use Vesper instead of Hesper, but I think they're re both referring to the evening hours like Vesper prayers. Um, but that bloom, blooms for a long time and um, I'm, I'm sure you would imagine um, and it is the case that hummingbirds really like those flowers. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to, with the help of several of the interns, start squeeze, tucking ferns into the cracks in between the rocks. Um, you know, in areas where the stay moist, I think the ferns will do just fine. We're going to bare root them wrap the roots and sag them off and shove them in there and hopefully they will take. And the fun thing about it is it's an idea I had, you know, sometime last year and I and um, I thought, well Mark probably wouldn't like it. I'll probably just have to do it under the cover of darkness and apologize. <laughs> you know, JC used to always say, you know, do something and then apologize for it later. And one day, um, you know, every now and then Mark and I have a walk through the garden together and it's re re really valuable. And one day he said to me, what do you think about tucking ferns in the wall? And that was just a wonderful experience that we were on the same day. Um, bumblebees will often find their way up into a big um, open-centered flower like this one on this um, campanula. The the old-fashioned biennial campanulas were called Canterbury Bells, and so I, I think of these as Canterbury Bells. Almost no one grows the old biennials anymore. You, you, um, this was not a planting of a great number of plants. This is a campanula that spreads quite rapidly, so not necessarily for small gardens, but here's a, one of our bumblebees wanting to visit the flower. We'd see a lot more bee act or pollinator activity this morning if it was a little bit warmer. Um, but there are, there are many other campanulas that are better behaved than this one. But if you have a large, gar large garden, these spreading plants are great as ground cover. You don't see a lot of weeds coming up to this, a plant like this that makes a solid cover. 
this isn't the main reason why we came down this way. Uh, this is an ornamental form of pomegranate, and if we, if I remember when we're out by the old pollinator garden, there's a fruiting one, and a, a fruiting pomegranate has about five petals and a huge numbers of stamens inside. Each of those little, well, I don't know what you call them, those little berries inside of a pomegranate was attached to a separate stamen. No, it wouldn't be attached to a separate stamen, a separate uh, stigma in the flower. And so all those reproductive parts have become all the additional petals. Um, and so these double flowered ones don't produce fruit. But the plant I want to show you is a little bit further on. Oh, and we're going to go past an allium. Um, garlic and uh, shallots and onions are alliums, but there are a lot of alliums that are grown um, for their garden flowers, and they're great pollinators. Um, garlic chives, which can be weedy if you let it go to seed, so don't let it go to seed, is a great plant for pollinators, and it's blooming in August when there's fewer things for insects to visit. We're um, focusing this summer on planting. So a lot of the uh, blank areas you see in this area should be filled with uh, plants before the end of the summer. But um, this is a plant native to Australia and Queensland. Um, hmm. um, Lomatia, Lomatia miracoides. Miracoides re means resemble, resembling mirica which is the uh, name for uh, bayberry and it used to be the name for wax myrtle but the uh, those t uh, botanists are now telling us to call our wax metal morella instead of hmm. mirica but it does have a narrow leaf like wax myrtle and um, it's in the protea family you think of those big glorious flowers of the proteas like you see in florist shop this, this isn't, you know, super showy, but it's in, been, been in bloom for about a month. It has a pleasant fragrance, and you can see a number of different pollinators on it. I see honeybees, and I don't know where different little chubby black and yellow bees, I just call them all bumblebees. I think the big ones are the carpenter bees, but there's a really cool wasp here. Um, and so it's a plant I want to propagate, so... I can have one in my garden at home. Does that fall with your amenities? Um, well, that's an interesting question because it, though it does look like wax myrtle, I wonder if it has another resemblance to it. I don't get anything. You different noses green. smell different things. <laughs> well, yeah, sort of green. The flower, the flowers have a nice fragrance. It's, it's a light fragrance, but I, I enjoy it. The single dahlias. You know, well, you can see this bumblebee right here on the single dahlia. They really like them. And, you know, again, this is in the same family as zinnias and purple cone flowers. You have that same arrangement of the ray flowers and the disc flowers. And you can see that bumblebee is making great use of that. But then you have, you know, these beautiful doubles and there's very, almost nothing left in the way of reproductive parts. So, you know, we, in a garden, you can have both. You know, your garden doesn't have to be completely devoid. Um, there's a really nice mm -hmm. uh, pipevine swallowtail butterfly. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in our gardens, you can you can have both. You know, the fancy cultivated varieties and, and things that support pollinators. Oh, does someone want to volunteer as a weeder in this bed? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Um, Chris mentioned at the beginning of our tour today about the pipevine swallowtail. Um, some, uh, some butterflies, um, as far as the caterpillars go, are generalists, like our, uh, our state butterfly. Which butterfly is our state butterfly? The tiger swallowtail, the, the big gorgeous yellow one with the black li lining or striping through the petals. petals. Well, the <laughs> butterflies are sort of like flowers that have taken wing. Um, it's a generalist. It will eat on uh, the caterpillars. We eat a wide range of things, but uh, the, our other um, 
swallowtail butters or butterflies are specialists and everyone certainly knows that monarch caterpillars are specialists they eat just um, milkweed and very close related things but the there is a huge amount of uh, pipe vines um, in this border but you rarely see much of it because the pipeline swallowtail caterpillars eat it to the ground multiple times through the course of the summer. Um, I guess first I'll talk about pipevine. The pipevine is Aristolochia, really long name, scary, very, very scary name, but Aristo, you know, same root as aristocrat, and Lokia is referring to birth. And so one, another common name for the Aristolochia is, in, is birthwort. In Europe, the native European Aristolochias were used to ease childbirth. Whether they have an effect, I don't know, but um, anyhow. But they are like the milkweeds, they're poisonous, and that's probably why the caterpillar eats them and is also brightly colored. Um, pipe vine comes from the shape of the flower, which looks like a, a Dutchman's pipe, you know, the Meerschaum pipe that comes down and goes back up. Um, and I just saw, yeah, here's an older caterpillar. The thing I do best of all is drop things out of my shirt pocket. I see a fanny pack in my future. But, um, yeah. Oh, did I lost this little one. Well, they change color over the course of the various in, in, end stars, isn't it? End stars, not in stars. Um, caterpillars, like snakes, shed their skin. They only can get so so big in their um, in their skin, so they have to sh molt and then they grow again until they fill fill out that skin. And I don't know. If you can see how um, this younger one is different color than the older one. And these will only eat pipeline, so you know if you took them home and you didn't have pipeline, they're going to starve to death. I did take some home because uh, a couple summers ago because I have a little bit of pipeline and they had very little left to eat here. Now so, this I'm sorry, what kind of caterpillar did you say? Pipe vine swallowtail. Oh, uh, pipe vine swallowtail. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we saw that that big black butterfly. There's one you in see the one? Dog. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, no, that's not a. Oh. That's probably not a pipe vine. Sorry. We have like three or four species of swallowtail that are black, and one thing that's distinctive, and maybe this one is just resting, but when they're hard to tell apart, the female pipe vine swallowtail has this big wash of blue on the lower pair of um, wings. I have to stop myself from calling it petals. Um, but the other thing that's, there's one over there that you know, just flew beyond our view. Another thing that's real distinctive about the pipeline swallowtail is that when it's feeding, it doesn't rest on the flower and st stand still, but it's constantly flapping its wings, and the other black swallowtails don't do that. So if you see one and you're wondering whether it's a pipeline or not, um, that is diagnostic. Oh no, that is a pipeline swallowtail. I saw the blue wash on her wings. She was just resting. Thanks for saying that, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I can put these caterpillars back down. A little bit more about this particular pipeline. This one is native to the southwest U.S. and um, um, Mexico. And if you look at a distribution map of the pipeline swallowtail, it's the whole eastern U.S. extending through the southwest into Mexico. So, you know, these, these ones are just happy. They're living here in North Carolina. They're able to go out for some Mexican food. Um, our local species of pipevine, there are two very large, vigorous vines, which are difficult to have in a small garden. And there's a little herbaceous perennial that occurs locally um, in our woodlands. And it's, uh, unless the pipevine swallowtail caterpillars have eaten it, I can point it out later, it's worth growing, but you wouldn't grow it because it's 
he thought it was beautiful. Well, enough on that. Well, one other thing. Um, do, well, you mentioned that somebody tried to root it. I guess it might root from stem trying. Um, this very slender vine. Um, there, it's throughout throughout here because it uh, grows from seed. And there was a, what I thought was going to be a clutch of little seedlings that I dug up for potting. And each one of them had like a five to six inch unbranched carrot-like tuberous root. And, you know, native to the southwest, it probably has to put up with drought. Getting eaten, eaten to the ground by caterpillars, you probably need a lot of food uh, stored away in uh, like a tuberous root underground. So I, it really surprised me when I dug them up because the plant is so slender and the root is substantial. Like sun, um, Where is it shaped? Shape? The, the question was, does it like sun or need sun? I've only grown it in sun. I tried in shade. Um, uh, our, our native species typically occur all the way to these passes. It has a flower, and a most marvelous flower. I'll, I'll pass it around so you can see the detail. But you see the Dutchman's pipe relationship, how it goes down and comes up. But this one is uh, Aristolochia fimbriata. The edge is fimbriated. No. Um, and they would flower a lot, except they get eaten so heavily. I wish um, we should probably grow some where we could exclude the caterpillars so we could produce seed. I'm going to pass it around so everyone can see it. It's really quite a marvelous little flower. Um, and the other question was, can you grow it in shade? I don't know. I haven't tried it. Our native species um, occur as woodland plants. But I've long felt that a lot of plants that grow under the shade of trees, it's not because they choose to, it's because they don't know how to operate a chainsaw. <laughs> um, you know, you know, a lot of things, you know, in the wild, dogwood usually occurs as an um, understory tree. Where does it bloom better? It blooms better when it gets a lot more sun than being an understory tree. <laughs> salvias, are, you know, the, the sages, are, the culinary sage is salvia officinalis. Officinalis means uh, of the apothecary shop. But most salvias we grow as ornamentals. Many of them are great for hummingbirds. I think hummingbirds will grow, I mean, visit this type of salvia, but notice the bumblebee on They especially like it. And um, I can't tell you the cultivar on this. It's, it was a new release last year and I just don't remember. But it's a shorter version of one you can buy readily called um, Mystic Spires. And they bloom all summer. And um, these are big because they came through the winter. It's not 100% reliably winter hardy, but uh, fairly reliable. What is that one again, sir? This, uh, I to this one, I can't tell you the cult oh. of our name because... Um, it's not labeled? Well, it might be Maryland, but there are a lot more of them, and I don't know if the label's stuck with the plants. Um, I can check, you know, that might be a label over there. Playing the blues and rocking? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, playing... Um, well, plant names have become, not the scientific part of the name, but the, the cult of our names and such have gotten so difficult nowadays because breeders give them this worthless cult of our name. Anybody know the real cult of our name of Knockout Rose, the original single red Knockout Rose? Yes. Um, Jim knew it. Yeah, the original, the, the, the true cult of our name of the single red um, knockout rose is rad raz r-a-d-r-a-z that is its official cultivar name in single quotes and everything the breeder of the knockout um, roses i don't remember his last name other than it starts with r-a-d so his introductions start with r-a-d knockout is the trademark name and the difficult the problem with that is trademark names do not have to necessarily stay with the original cultivar. 
it's like if um, you know if you made Tide detergent and you completely changed Tide detergent, you're the owner of that name Tide, so it could be anything you want. It might not be the product you liked in the past. The same cultivar so, can also have two trade names. Oh, or more. Excellent point. Yes. Did everybody hear, Chris? So uh, I, I never told. So this one is Salvia. The rock. The trademark name is Rocking, and then the. Uh, well, I'm not. Well, I guess the cultivar name is Playing the Blues. So look for some version of that in the garden center. <laughs> Mystic Spires looks exactly like this. That gets about this tall. And Mystic Spires was produced by irradiating the original hybrid, which is um, Indigo Spires, which if it stood up on its own is about this tall. But uh, Indigo Spires doesn't um, stand up on its own, so I'm happy to grow Mystic Spires or, or, or one of these slightly shorter ones. The Nevadas, the Catmints, superb for bumblebees. And long season of blue. Could that smell actually be a dead animal or feces from an animal that passed through? It could be, but it, uh, we haven't spread any fertilizer. Um, it doesn't really smell like a dead animal. It smells more like um, like an one of the aroids blooming. On a warm, sunny summer day, well, I guess the fish, well, calendar is meaningless to me. It's summertime. Um, on a warm sunny summer day the excuse me angels trumpets would be done would be done blooming already the flowers just last one evening this one's going to open up tonight about seven o'clock if someone invites you to dinner and dinner's early enough you'll pick a bunch of these at this stage and put them on their dining room table and you can watch them open up if they open up you know quick enough you can actually watch them open but um, in the evening when they're real fragrant, the honeybees will uh, be inside the flowers. Come dusk and evening, um, the big hawk moths will fly into the flowers. The hawk moths are, you know, their, their bodies are about the size of my thumb and their wingspan is about like that. And one of, our, one of the hawk moths is the uh, adult of the cabbage um, hornworm not the cabbage, the tomato hornworm caterpillar that, you know, maybe the biggest of our caterpillars, the big green one with the little horn on the tail. What is this plant again? Uh, this is one of the angel's trumpets. Um, the angel's trumpets comprise two uh, genera. This is uh, Datora. It's Datora inoxia. The other genus that's called angel's trumpets are the Brugmansias, and um, they're Lar generally large growing plants. Flowers look very much like that. I can pick this because this flower only lasts one day. Um, but the Bergmansia flowers are pendant. You know, when the, w in the evening when they're in full bloom, they might be like that, but they don't face upward. They're pendant. What's their native habitat? Uh, southwest U.S. into Mexico. The Bergmansias are um, generally from moister uh, subtropical areas. Some of the um, Brugmansias will overwinter, um, especially when we don't have winters like this past one. I haven't seen um, Charles Grimaldi return yet, and he's been in my garden at home for through four or five winters before this one. Do they produce a pod or Yeah, um, the Brugmansias make a long, narrow pod. Um, but the Datura Jimson weed is a Datura, and the fruit is very much like the, uh, Datura uh, Jimson weed. It's about the size of a green zebra tomato, but real thorn thorny on the outside, like a horse chestnut or chestnut fir. Um, it's this plant is big because it overwintered. They also produce carpets of seedlings. Verbenas and heliotrope are excellent for um, pollinators they, they have a you know a little short floral tube so the smaller um, pollinators smaller butterflies especially visit their flowers this pink one is verbena canadensis the wild type and um 
it is almost all the other verbenas we grow are hybrids and you know verbena canadensis probably figures into that into the parentage but um there are other parents are you know more tropical type species and so a lot of those hybrids like homestead purple if we have a normal mild winter we'll come through the winter but this past winter wiped out um, all of our verbenas except for canadensis now these canadensis weren't planted um, until this spring but i've had them in clients gardens in my own garden at home and they come through every winter in a mild winter they'll even bloom most of the winter um, this, this plant with the uh, lavender flowers is heliotrope um, Heliotropia. <coughs> now i don't know how we got this label on this verbena this is this little lavender one over here um, yeah the heliotrope is heliotropium um amplexicoli that's a mouthful um, here's a good example um amplexicoli means clasping the stems and there's better examples of that in um other plants with that specific epithet but the well you know that's not even all that that doesn't describe this all that well, but that's what mm -hmm. Antipsychol means. But um, both of them will bloom all summer. And this has an interesting inflorescence. It's what's called the scurpoid sign. Now, I don't remember what distinguish, what, um, what a sign is, but scurpoid is referring to a scorpion. And if you think of a scorpion tail curved up over the back, if you look from the side at the uh, leading edge of this inflorescence you see it's it's cur curled over and then it sort of you know uncurls as it continues to bloom mm -hmm. so let me pass that around but both are very drought tolerant i've seen the heliotrope which i think is native to south america naturalized <laughs> on roadsides like in you know coastal south carolina and georgia it's really hard to find <coughs> in the trade here i've really looked, looked, looked at found it one place John Martin and Jeff Bottoms, uh, Creedmoor. Yeah, um, yeah, Cedar Creek. Uh, John, John Martin and uh, Jeff Bottoms have a little backyard nursery, uh, Falls Revival in Raleigh. But John works at Cedar Creek Craft Gallery in Creedmoor, just north of um, 85, and they grow a wide range of. Um, perennials that we used to be able to find readily and don't anymore and a lot of really wonderful tender perennials that we use as um, annuals and they do sell that this um, and, but we get carpets of seedlings so we potted some up recently so maybe in another few weeks you'll see it on our little plant cart unfortunately this heliotrope does not have the fragrance it's not fragrant at all but it doesn't have that exquisite fragrance of the common heliotrope. Yes, Adam. Well, um, I hesitated to say that because I, I, it certainly looks like it should be in the same family as verbena, but with that skirpoid sign, I think it might not be. So let me, we'll look it up. Well, someone with a um, smartphone could look it up and see what family it is. Thank you, Adam. Flowers that are pleasantly fragrant, would you assume that those are good for pollinators? Pro probably, yeah. Is that's... there any reason for the, a pleasant fragrance other than to attract pollinators? Probably not. Um, the question was, is it safe to assume that a plant with a pleasant fragrance would be good for pollinators? And uh, actually, I'm going to modify my answer, Marilyn, a little bit. Um, if it's a, well, you know, maybe a more general answer if a plant has a showy flower the only purpose of having a showy uh, flower is to get pollinated the only purpose of the flower is for reproduction um you know all right they were put here on earth to make us happy um but you know the only purpose of a flower is for reproduction when man starts playing with things and changing them then you know rules go out the window but if it has you know, a, a simple flower, not double, 
and um, I would assume it's getting pollinated by somebody. Now we we grow plants from all around the world, so sometimes um, you know we've left their pollinators behind because some flowers have specific pollinators. Most flowers don't, um, but you know if it has a fragrance, that's part of attracting a pollinator as well. Are there any double flowers that are pollinators or are all double flowers not pollinators? I, I would never say that all double flowers are not good for pollinators. I, I don't know if that sentence made any sense. Um, you know, you have a range of d doubling in flowers. Um, you know, even like a, a very double camellia will sometimes set fruit. Um, you know, there might, and, and breeders will sometimes pull apart a double flower to find the one remaining anther or the one remaining pistil or something if they're using it in crosses. So, you know, n not all double flowers are completely sterile. Um, family. Yeah, what family? That makes sense. Uh, the heliotropes in the borage family, which I was almost going to guess because the, uh, that scurpoid sign is real common in the borage family. Even borage has that scurpoid sign. Thank you. Um, phlox. The phlox is a big genus. I think all but one are native to North America. Some of our earliest spring flowering herbaceous perennials are phlox. You think of the creeping phlox, the moss phlox with the evergreen spiky foliage. I, I love the plant to begin with, but it's also really good for pollinators because it's blooming so early. And, you know, things like um, tiger swallowtails or state butterfly um, must overwinter as an adult because even in, when, do, when does that bloom? Like March, sort of? You'll see adult butterflies feeding on them. Um, but then, you know, this Phlox pilo pilosa, Ozark phlox is about done, but then all summer long there's the tall phlox blooming. They're all, all good for pollinators. Certainly not the time of year to see chrysanthemums in bloom, mm -hmm. um, but chrysanthemums and other October blooming things are superb for pollinators because um, especially monarchs were f fueling up the fly back to Mexico. Um, it's important to um, cite, if you're pl specifically planning for planting for pollinators and you're thinking about ha things that would be in bloom in um, late summer and fall, it's important to cite them in a sunny location because you can have the exact same mum in, in a garden where it's no sunny in the summertime but then shady in the fall because the movement of the sun has changed so much. Um, um, you can have the same mum in, mum in two different locations and the one in the sun will be covered in pollinators. Now again, this is a good example. The double mums won't attract many pollinators, but the daisy type mum, superb pollinator plant. Doug, what about this? Yes. This is... Um, Calaroe, okay. um, Calaroe um, in crater. It's a related to hibiscus. You know the five petals with the column in the center with all the stamens. Um, native uh, prairie plant. Um, th this is the one that's on the steps, uh, just g above the cascade by the building. There's a second species here. Oh, it's, it's done blooming. Um, Calaroe digitata. Digitata referring to fingers. Here's a... But it, it's done blooming, but you can see the uh, foliage is, you know, very deeply divided, sort of like the fingers on a hand. But it, it, this plant was just planted last fall, but you know, when it's full height, it'd be more about this height. And volucreta spreads really wide. Notice what this bumblebee is doing. He's too fat to enter the flower through the mouth of the flower. So he's 
I don't know if it's the real name, but I heard someone refer to them as robber bees. They'll rip open the flower at the base and get to the nectar and pollen down at the base. And, um, you know, they're part of the web of life, but sometimes, you know, like Salvi Guarnitica, will, by the end of the day, look pretty shabby because the robber bees have um, opened all the flowers at the base. I don't know if this fits into our um, topic of the day, but take a moment and, well, I'll pick a flower. Sometimes I wonder if an alarm's gonna go off. <laughs> this is a, the genus Gladiolia is huge. Um, almost entirely native to Africa. Um, a lot of them are winter growing, so they don't sink with our climate because they'd be winter hardy, except they're growing when we have cold weather. Um, but this is um, Gladiolus papilio, papilio referring to butterfly. And maybe not a great beauty because, you know, it's sort of an odd color, but, and they don't open any more than this, but the markings inside are really pretty. We'll just pass that on. And it's something we've had in the border for decades. But, and when Edith and I came back to the border in 2012, we thought it was gone, but then little pieces started showing up and it spreads underground slowly. The um, Amistad sage is a hybrid between Salvia guaranitica and looks very much like Salvia guaranitica. I think the other parent is maybe Cardinalis, which is red, guaranitica is blue. But um, this is one plant, it's not spreading underground, it, it dies away to a crown about like this size but it just gets huge. Um, and it blooms all summer. And we do see um, bumblebees visiting it, but with that long tubular flower, uh, I, I'll say it, but don't need to say it, that um, hummingbirds love it. The bird of paradise is not being as pretty as it could be. Now, you're, you're all far too polite, but I'm sure somebody's muttering under their breath, this is not bird of paradise. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the problem with um, the flowers that fall apart. No, that's the mm -hmm. problem with common names. It's, you know, bird of paradise is also that tropical plant with the banana-like leaf, which is Strelitzia. Um, and this, this is, it doesn't have any good flowers to that. I don't know why it's grumpy. But, well, here you can see a better example back here. The long, really, really long red stamens that extend well past the yellow pe petals. And it'll um, um, repeat bloom on and off all summer. Its first big bloom is its best. But um, the genus is um, Cesalpinia, named for an Italian physician whose name was uh, Cesalpini. And the, um, the other bird of paradise, its name has a real interesting story, especially when I was living outside of Charlotte, because it's related to Charlotte. Um, the scientific name of the, the more common bird of paradise is Strelitzia regine. Regine means of the queen. Uh, um, St Strelitzia, good German name, Strelitz. Well, King George III, the one we went had a little disagreement with, his queen was uh, Queen Charlotte, and that's where the city of Charlotte gets its name. But she was the princess of Strelitz, Mecklenburg. So Strelitz became the generic name of the plant, Strelitzia, and we have Mecklenburg County, which is where Charlotte is, and there's also Mecklenburg County just over the border in Virginia. If you've been up to Pine Knot Farm for their Hellebore open houses, you were in Mecklenburg County. So, you know, dump it. I, I, I love knowing the derivation of words and I like to present them because I think sometimes people are just so scared of the scientific names of plants that they don't think they could ever make any sense of them. What is this green thing? 
Well, that's one a plant name for somebody whose family name is Russell. It's Rosselia. Is that uh, just an annual because it's in a pot? Um, it would be treated as an annual, but we put it in the greenhouse. Yeah, there are a lot of things we treat as annuals, and the term tender perennial is maybe a little bit difficult to wrap one's brain around, but so many of the things we grow as annuals are truly perennial in a frost-free climate. We just treat them as annuals. Um, it's Rosselia equisita formis, which means a form like equisetum, which is horsetail. And you can see the foliage looks very much like horsetail. And I don't mean like a horse's tail, but the plant that's called horsetail. Mm -hmm. And again, red tubular flowers, anyone want to guess who, who visits those flowers? Mm -hmm. And this is just an ornamental form of um, pineapple. Now the youngsters in this crowd probably never encountered a pineapple in the grocery store which, with vicious thorns on the edge of the leaves, but those of us uh, with a few more years on us remember that um, pineapples all, used to always come with this awful, awful salt tooth edge. I never quite figured out why, wh why it was when it was time to bring the pineapples in um, in a former garden that I worked in that no one really offered to help me move them in. <laughs> but you, you know, if you don't believe me, how awful they are, just you know, come up and get personal with it. <laughs> cone flowers, yellow and orange cone, cone flowers are Rudbeckia. You know, the, those damn Germans seem to get named, a whole lot of plants seem to get named after um, a lot of Germans. My, my family name is German, so I can say damn Germans. Um, but this is Rudbeckia maxima, maxima being, meaning big. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the cone flowers, the purple cone flowers and all the Rudbeckias, once they're done blooming and no longer supporting pollinators, the um, birds uh, are happy to have the seed, so a multi-purpose plant in the garden. Species canna. All the cannas in the perennial border are ones with, you know, man-made big flowers. But the little wild types, many of them have little tubular flowers. Hummingbirds love them. They will visit some of the modern hybrids, but those little ones with tubular flowers are great hummingbird plants. I showed you, well, here's another ornamental pomegranate, and I told you that the fruiting ones just have five petals. Here's, here's uh, this is a smaller growing cultivar, but you can see in the uh, fruiting pomegranates, the ones you would grow for fruit, um, they just have five petals, and you can see all the reproductive parts in the center. Um, this is the old pollinator garden that some um, volunteers replanting. Um, Oh, he, here, here's, I forgot we planted these cannas, but you see, not a tremendously showy flower compared to the modern hybrids, but hummingbirds um, love those little wild type flowers. Sometimes you can grow um, different selections of the same plant and uh, one will support pollinators and one won't. Neither of these are superb examples, but in the wild, hydrangea flowers look more like that and not like this. Because what was the purpose of flowers? For reproduction. Well, um, in a hydrangea, these small flowers in the center are fertile. These big showy flowers on the outer edge are acting sort of like petals on a zinnia or something. They're, they're just, you know, boosting up the eye appeal. Um, so th this is, represents a wild plant and very supportive of pollinators. 
bees and such love hummingbird flower um, hummingbird flowers. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not used to talking nonstop for an, uh, more than an hour. Um, so, but occasionally what happens is all of these little fertile flowers become the showy uh, flowers. And so it's no longer fertile and you end up with flowers like this, uh, which are a lot showier, but they don't support many pollinators. Um, so, you know, if you want a hydrangea paniculata, which is a superb garden plant uh, for summer bloom, you know, full sun and very tolerant of, of dry conditions and stuff, you, you might select one that has a nice mixture of sterile and fertile flowers as opposed to something like limelight, which is, you know, th which is this dense head, this gorgeous dense head of all fertile flowers. Um, so th those are the kind of choices you can make when you're selecting plants for your garden. Uh, butterflies is the spice bush swallowtail. This is our native spice bush, not to be confused with the Korean spice bush viburnum. This is um, a lindera, named for somebody named um, Linder. A lot of people pronounce it um, Lindera. I won't argue about which pronunciation. I like to preserve the, the person's family name's uh, pronunciation. It has little flowers in the spring. It would never get a blue ribbon for uh, being a showy ornamental. But this is the only plant that our spice bush um, caterpillar will eat. And um, though I ha um, we have a large, in, in the U.S., there's one or maybe two species of Lindera, um, but there are many, many Asian ones, and the Arboretum has many Asian ones, so Tim and I have wondered why this garden isn't thick with spice bush caterpillars. You would think that maybe they'd go out for Chinese occasionally and uh, eat, you know, an Asian Viburnum, uh, not Viburnum, Lindera, but it's a quiet little plant. Apparently the fruit of it, they're male or female, so only the female have fruit. Apparently the, um, the fruit you can get a pretty good price on. You know, you know about this for well, brewing I, beer? I think um, we have one in our um, uh, like crab tree demo garden, okay. I think. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've noticed the fruit. Is that the same as Sweet Betsy? No. no. Okay. No, that's calicanthus, which this has tiny little yellow flowers, like little beads of flowers, before it leaves out. Sweet Bessie is Carolina Allspice, and there's someone, that that's the one that, oh, is anyone wearing our, this year's Arboretum t-shirt? No, because it has Elysium on it, and Elysium and Sweet Betsy have very similar flowers that, you know, sort of maroon, typically maroon flower with lots and lots of petals about that size. Okay. And if you get a good sweet Betsy, the flowers are very fragrant. Is that the Lindera? However you say a Lindera, does it have good fall color? Generally yellow. Okay. Yeah, um, generally a really nice yellow. Nothing more exciting than yellow, though. What? One of our Asian ones has some of the most outstanding fall foliage that we have here at the Arboretum. And so, some of the Asian species are one of those plants where the leaves turn brown with frost but then hang on the tree all winter, which can be a, a pretty effect in the winter garden. Oh, we have a caterpillar. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, one of our um, swallowtails is called the Eastern Black Swallowtail or sometimes um, the celery butterfly, or I guess the cat caterpillar is called celery caterpillar. And if you've ever grown parsley, you'll probably end up with it. Um, here's a young caterpillar, you know, about a third full size. <laughs> and this is on bronze fennel because th that ca caterpillar, that will eat almost anything in the um, Apiaceae, which is the parsley family. So dill, fennel, parsley. I don't think I've ever had it on my cilantro, but other other things like that. And um, it's this caterpillar is often confused with the monarch caterpillar because they're sort of similar, but if you ever saw a picture of both, you would see the difference. And I'm going to see if I can annoy it. Um, 
Come here. Maybe, maybe they don't do it when they're little. But it has, if you annoy it enough, it will send out these two horns on its head and they're bright, sort of orange yellow. And they're, I'm gonna get the name wrong. It's something like Osmeteria or something. Osme means smell. You know, like Osmanthus, fragrant flower or smelly flower. Um, and they, they have some sort of, uh, you know, odor that I guess if you're a bird who's, you know, about to put it in your mouth, you won't, won't eat it. Mm -hmm. Is Queen Anne's lace in that family? Yes. Yeah, the car carrots and par parsnips and... Sorry, buddy. I don't, I don't... I'm not disturbing the caterpillar because it, it makes, it's something I like to do. I'm just, I want you all to see him. Or her. There it is. Paul Paul, um, yet another one of our native um, butterflies is the zebra swallowtail, not the tiger swallowtail, the zebra swallowtail, which is black and white. And have you all seen a zebra swallowtail? I, some summers I don't see any at all. Long, long tail. You know, when we were kids, other kids told us that, that they sting with those tails, which of course they don't. But black, sort of cream white with jet black stripes and one of the uh, genders have bright yellow, bright red spots at the base of the thing. But the only thing the caterpillars eat is our pawpaw. And I, I have planned for pawpaws in gardens specifically with the hope that zebra swallowtails will come, but I've never seen them on a plant. But um, if you see one, you'll know it. And they're, they're fairly lazy flyers. You know, they go so like flop, flop, or flap, flap, and then they sort of coast a bit and flap a few more times. They're not a really strong flyer, but a beautiful thing. Some people are fond of the Nellie R. Stevens hedge. And if you're one of those, say goodbye. This Friday, this is going away. And people have reactions like yours. But this is this is 15 feet. This is 15 feet to this point. This is 15 feet by hundreds of feet. Think of how many other plants we can plant here. And last year, the Nellie R. Stevens hedge behind the perennial border was cut down. And um, if you all want to, those of you who are upset that we're removing the Nellie R. Stevens hedge, would like to fund a full-time position for somebody to spend their entire time just maintaining the Nellie R. Stevens hedge at, you know, eight foot and three foot wide, fine, we'll, we'll keep the hedge, but I can't justify the time it would take to keep it in an appropriate size. Is this a, is this yeah. Yeah, this hedge used to go all the way down to the property line. And, um, so what would happen if you just cut it off low? Would it get shoots? Put it It'll come up. The, the one behind the... Uh, the fences. Pen, yeah, oh. it's almost as tall as that fence now. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's been cut down. You know, we're talking about 30-year-old hedge. It's been cut down at least three times. Virginia, you... Uh, not Virginia, I'm sorry. Vivian, <laughs> you've been here the whole time. It's been cut at least three times, if yes. not four. Yes. I think yeah. it was four times, and the second time they did it, they also root pruned it. Yeah, we used to have a barrier in the ground to keep the roots out of the perennial border. Um, but this was cut back. You can see where it was cut back last time. Did the barrier for the roots work? Um, I think it worked until somebody removed it or plowed <laughs> it in or something like that. Yeah. What do you know? What kind of barrier it was? I'm just curious. It was like almost like a rigid plastic but not fully rigid okay. do you know uh, how deep it was how tall? several feet several feet wow. yeah okay. yeah it was a commercial product but okay. you know you're asking me a question about something that hasn't existed for 20 years yeah this is this is a, a typical wild rose flower five petals that's all five petals and huge numbers of stamens and i guess just one pistil in the center and this is a native species, Rosa palustris. There's a bunch of real similar species, Virginiana and Caroliniana. Um, this fragrant? one is not, 
one. Fragrance? Yes. I'll pass it around in a second. It has a lovely fragrance. And normally you'd see a bumblebee running around and around in the center of the flower. And maybe one of them come and prove to you that I'm not a liar. <laughs> um, but this is not a plant for a small garden because it spreads quickly underground and makes a big thicket. But if you had a big piece of land, and palustris means of swamp, so it would also tolerate a wet spot. Um, another really beautiful feature of this plant, it makes a pretty good sized fruit that persists all winter. Bright red fruit. Um, I guess the birds might eventually take it. But I'll pass this around and now don't use up all the all the uh, fragrance. <laughs> Chet, save some. <laughs> um, but you know, there are a lot of really beautiful roses in the rose garden, but almost all of them are, um, you know, really double ones, so they don't offer anything to uh, pollinators. Um, and there are, you know, even when you get, like, anyone remember an old single hybrid tea rose called a Dainty Bess? Um, it, was, it was a beauty, but it, it was just as bad about black spot as um, other hybrid teas. You know, even when you get a, a hybridized rose that's single, it's usually still not a good um, pollinator plant. There's a few flowers on that magnolia over there. Um, magnolias are one of the earliest flowering plants, and so they would have evolved before there's honey honeybees, and often you will see beetles and flies vis visiting magnolia flowers. Of course, why is this crackling? Is the table loose, Doug? Oh, well, maybe. But they um, are pleasantly fragrant. So that some are and some aren't. Okay. Um, of our native um, big leaf magnolias, it, it, that's Macrophylla up over the maple there. It has a nice fragrance, but Tripetala smells pretty bad. Yeah. Work like around the margin of a, yes. a pond or something? Yeah, the question right? was would the Rosa Palestis work around the margin of the pond? Absolutely. That's where I planted in the client's garden. Okay. It grows right down to water's edge. Okay. Yeah. Because I have, with my deer, there's itea that's native there, and the deer eat everything that's on dry land side, but they apparently don't want to get their feet wet. They don't weigh and eat stuff on the water They'll side. They'll be getting a boat. Um, well, I was thinking if I planted that along the edge of the lake. The do, do they eat itea in your yes. garden? Really? Yes. I planted masses. Well, masses of it in a client's garden because one they had areas that were periodically too wet for most things and itea loves that right and because the deer didn't touch it but that's just the thing about deer in my yard they do the, yeah i have it planted in the culvert you know where the, the runs underneath the driveway sure. in the culvert down yeah. by the street and the, the plants are all vase-shaped because they nibble it up to about four feet. So anything four feet and higher is fine. But yeah, well, you know, people there. often will tell you deer don't eat Japanese maples or dogwoods. They do. Well, they do. Yeah. But once you get them above four feet, they don't eat it. And I think right. those, those people who never had a little dogwood or maple d didn't have the experience of the deer destroying them. Mm -hmm. And so they tell other people, oh, they don't eat them. So Viv just asked Doug if the hollies are being totally and absolutely gotten rid of. Yes, the stumps, stumps are being out. ground out. There you go. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the ones behind the perennial border are getting ground out too. We can have a mixed planting of shrubs there in display. You know, for the the perennial border is like 365 feet long or so. So imagine a mixed planting that length. That, how many plants? You know, that's close to a hundred different plants you could have in a mixed planting behind the perennial border. And Lord knows we have a lot of plants that need need uh, have their, need to get planted. These two beds are specifically planted for pollinators and um, caterpillars, but the Arboretum is not responsible for their upkeep, so any of those nasty thoughts you thought a moment ago do not direct them to Arboretum staff and volunteers. These are um, and Spafford's horticulture professor in the department's uh, beds. But there's lots of really great plants in here, many of which we saw and some that we haven't. The uh, passion vine, Passiflora. Um, oh, here's a flower. You know, one, one of the most amazing flowers. This is our native one. If you grew up in the country, you might have grown up eating the fruit, um, May Pops. 
Um, but uh, the the uh, orange fritillaria butterflies uh, feed on the foliage. Um, native rattlesnake master, which is actually the same family as carrots and parsley, though I've never seen the black swallowtail eat it, but it's a great... Um, that's the thing about the umble family, the parsley and the dill. The foliage feeds caterpillars, but the flowers feed a horde of different um, pollinators. We didn't see any mountain mints in the garden. Pycnanthemum. We've got several bee things up for bees to lay their eggs in. Yeah. Um, the mountain mints are, you know, in that huge family, the mint family, along with salvia and monarda and so many things. Some of them are real rapid spreaders. This is um, supposedly Pycnanthemum and Canum. We'll have it for sale shortly, but uh, these plants came from Niche Nursery in, in Chapel Hill. I know so because I found their label on the plants in the ground, but they bloom for months and they're, you know, if you like watching insects, you could spend a day just standing looking at a, a clump of Pycnanthemum because you'll see wasps and bees and um, some butterflies um, and it's just, you know, creatures that you don't see otherwise. And the fo foliage on, on this one is fairly minty. Not all of them are. I don't know if you want to pass it around or just take my word for it. Um, there's a bunch of different asters in here which are good in late summer and fall. Of course the orange butterfly weed. Um, one of the Asclepias, uh, great for pollinators, but that's one of the um, species that um, the monarch caterpillars eat. And we're sort of running out of time, but we'll just go another 50 feet and look at a bed that's specifically planted for caterpillars. Another volunteer came to us and said, you have all these pollinator gardens, how about a garden for um, uh, for the caterpillars, because you don't have one without the other. And um, Bernadette Clark, who's in charge of the color trials, said that we could use this bed. And I should have looked at Daryl's list before standing here this morning, because uh, I don't remember who feeds on some of these. Um, the first plant is Angelica palestris, which is a European plant we raised from seed and don't know too much about, but we thought, well, it's in that Umble family, so maybe uh, the same things that eat dill and fennel would eat it. Our native senna's, which is a legume, feed somebody. Um, and then two uh, Asclepias, or the Asclepias tuberosa, the common orange one like we saw over there. And this somewhat problematic species, um, Asclepias curasavica, curasavica referring to the city of Curacao. Um, sometimes called blood flower. It's actually, it, it's a perennial that's not winter hardy here. The problem with it, according to some people, is that whereas our native Asclepias are sort of going dormant by late summer, or maybe early fall, when the monarchs need to leave and go back to Me Mexico, this will continue growing up until frost. So it might encourage um, monarchs to linger longer and not get on the plane to Mexico in time. Um, there's also some thought that caterpillars sometimes pick up pathogens from their host plants and they, this might have a little bit more of that pathogen. A sunflower that Daryl planted for somebody and then we have lovage which is sort of like a perennial um, celery. If you grab a leaf, you'll see it smells just like celery. Uh, again, in the umble family, so black swallowtail. The little uh, Aristolochia you saw earlier, um, the birthwort. And we didn't have hollyhocks to give them, so this is um, a hibiscus that might feed the same caterpillars. Um, Another milkweed, Asclepius, Asclepius um, incarnata, the swamp milkweed. Um, it doesn't, like 
lot of wet site plants, it doesn't have to have a wet site. Pink or white flowers, depending on the cultivar. It looks like these are all pink ones from the label. And then, um, you know, three more members of the Umble family. You saw the bronze fennel and then the dill, which smells so wonderful. I want to go eat a dill pickle for lunch and parsley. Um, I think we've hit all the highlights. You know, the, we could go on all day and I have to do this again tonight. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's time to stop. These other things take up our time. But you can also start to see little creatures visiting the tiny flowers of um, Bill. Uh, any questions before we call it a day? We passed a lot of spider wars. Does that attract any pollinators? I think it must. It certainly produces, you know, dump truck loads full of seeds. We're trying to eliminate the spider wart from the perennial border because it comes up everywhere. Mm -hmm. But um, it must feed somebody. You know, I, I think, um, you know, often I see flowers and I don't see anybody visiting the, those flowers, but I think our ignorance really doesn't prove anything other than our ignorance. And ig ignorance is not stupidity. Ignorance is just the lack of awareness or knowledge. So. You know, and sometimes when flowers are as tiny as the individual florets on, a, on that dill umble, um, you know, I can't see the creatures, but I sort of see a, something moving around them. So if a plant is a wild plant and it has flowers, it's probably supporting somebody. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Would you take this and repeat that? <laughs> yeah. Viv, Viv just said something really wonderful. Said, That's the end. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. Yeah. We didn't hear it. Let me see if I can get it right. This doesn't sound like it's working anymore. It's losing power. It's, it's still doing a little power. bit. The absence of evidence is not proof. proof. Evidence. What? Evidence of absence. It's not proof of Say absence. Say aloud. Yeah. You're okay. right. Proof. Absence of evidence is not proof of absence. Okay. Did you all hear that now? Or not the quite? Absence of evidence is not proof of absence. 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 Be a test next week. Yeah. <laughs> Proving a negative. Okay. Essential. We have a Ladybug beetle, which, you know, some adult beetles, well, some adult insects don't eat at all. When they become an adult, they have enough stored food so they don't have to eat. Moths, it's true of a lot of moths. Um, I don't know, I don't, I think a lot of beetles do visit flowers. But the lady ladybug um, larva is an insectivore, important one, eats a lot of aphids. Sorry. Battery came back to life. Yeah, just to scare me. <laughs> that means the end. Yes, that's that's our. <laughs> thank you, Doug. All right, thank, thank you, you very much, Doug. Thank you. Thank you.